A year ago, I put up a Raspberry Pi against my Asus Dornes, but the Pi just couldn't keep up. Over the network, I got under 100 megabytes per second. But this year, there's a new single board computer in town, the ROC5 Model B. This thing is way faster. Internally, it can write data over a gigabyte per second. Could I build a better DIY NAS with this thing? Maybe. My original plan was to upgrade my old NAS with this new dual-purpose 10 gig M.2 card and put it up against the ROC5. The card is pretty neat, and it made it so I could have both 10 gig networking and two NVMe cache drives on my 6-bay NAS. But, well, two things changed my mind. First, Asus Store came out with this thing, and it's even faster. It's got all NVMe flash storage, and this model has 10 gig networking built right in. Second, a maker named Rick Johnson sent me this thing, the Pocket NAS. It also has M.2 flash storage, but with a few compromises. I'll get to that later. To be clear, Asus Store and Rick both sent these to me for testing. There was no other compensation, and they had no input into the content of this video. What's interesting about both of these solutions is they only use SSD storage. Good SSDs, at least, have great random access performance, they use less power than hard drives, and they take up a lot less space. They are more expensive per terabyte, but if you can stomach the price, or you just want a quiet all-flash NAS for video editing or a small media library, they look great on paper. First up, the Pocket NAS. Now, this is a very early prototype. Rick is working on a new design that fixes the problems that I'll point out. But this thing is a 6-drive SATA NAS. It uses these tiny M.2 SATA SSDs. I assembled this origami of PCBs, and then I installed six of these Team Group 1TB drives. These things aren't that expensive. They only cost about 40 bucks each. All in, this whole kit with six terabytes of storage cost me 600 bucks. But this thing doesn't come with a case, at least not the prototype I have. And it's completely DIY, meaning software and support is on you. I booted up a copy of Armbian Linux, then I installed Open Media Vault from scratch. Open Media Vault is pretty good, but it's a bit less intuitive than the software you get with a pre-built NAS. Creating a storage array with all those M.2 drives requires a bunch of clicking around, and one thing I don't like at all about OMV is how almost every action you take, it takes a few seconds, then this warning pops up saying you have to apply the change, then that takes a few seconds, and finally you can be on your way again. I wrote up an entire blog post on how to set up OMV on the ROC5 Model B, so go read that. I, I won't cover it in detail here. OMV's interface quirks were a minor issue, but what wasn't a minor issue was how half the SSDs here had issues. That's because this complex origami assembly resulted in a few broken connections from shipping. That's a big reason Rick is redesigning the pocket NAS. These two drives on top don't get power, and one of the slots on the second board is just flaky, meaning OMV would just see the drive drop out sometimes. I decided to just use these three working drives in RAID 5. That means I have two drives of storage space and a third drive for redundancy. I could lose any of the three working SSDs and not lose any data. On the Raspberry Pi, RAID 5 was pretty slow. That's because every time you write data, the CPU has to do a data parity calculation, then write that extra bit of data to the third drive. Luckily, this ROC5 has a faster CPU, and it's not the bottleneck anymore. Using the built-in 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, I could write up to 1.2 gigabits over the network, though the average was more like a gigabit, just over 100 megabytes per second. So that's a win over last year's Raspberry Pi, but still not as good as my old spinning disk Asus store. Also, write speed was spiky. It would write a bunch, then it would slow down, then write a bunch again. I also measured power consumption, and the Pocket NAS uses about 11 watts of power max. About an hour into a 300 gigabyte copy, some cache must have filled up because write speed slowed down to 45 megabytes per second and stayed that way until the copy was done. You can see that clearly on this network graph. The write speed just flatlines after a while. But it is a good long while. Most people aren't copying hundreds of gigabytes at a time like this. Copying back data from the NAS, I got up to 300 megabytes per second. That's about three times faster, but it didn't quite saturate the 2.5 gig connection. Still, that's a lot faster than I could get with the Raspberry Pi. And the read speeds were a little bursty still. So write performance is certainly better than the Pi, but not as much as I'd hoped. And read performance is very good, but it still couldn't saturate my 2.5 gigabit network. I like the promise of this little pocket NAS, but it's not without its compromises. Besides the origami approach that makes this thing harder to assemble, the only other negative for me is this little fan and heatsink. For a prototype, it works, but even with a fan control on to slow it down, it's a little bit noisy. I hope the final design has better cooling. Now, moving on to this PS2-style slab of black plastic, this is the Flash Door 12 Pro. 
It has a quad-core Intel N5105 CPU. It ships with four gigs of RAM, which in my opinion is a little too small. Eight would probably be adequate, but I upgraded this one to 16 gigs, which is the maximum that N5105 supports. Since this thing uses an Intel x86 processor, I could even install TrueNAS on it if I want. And I will. We'll get to that. But for now, I'm going to test it with ADM, which is Asus Store's basic NAS OS based on BusyBox Linux. Oh, and did I mention I also filled up the whole thing with not 6, but 12 one terabyte SSDs? I bought these Team Group NVMEs with DRAM cache, so hopefully with this many, they won't slow down after an hour like the Pocket NAS and its cheaper SATA drives. And one other quick note, I love Asus Store's toolless M.2 slots. All you have to do is pull back on the tab and push down on the drive. The NVMe SSDs I bought were five bucks more per drive than the SATA ones in the Pocket NAS. So all in, this setup cost about 1300 bucks. You could keep it under a thousand bucks if you don't go insane filling up all the bays right away. So this thing's double the price of the Pocket NAS, but that's also with double the storage plus 10 gig ethernet and 16 gigs of RAM, so it's definitely an upgrade in specs. For double the price, does performance also double? Short answer, yes. The little Celeron CPU inside does bottleneck write speeds a little, topping out around 600 megabytes per second, but that's still five times faster than the Pocket NAS. And read speeds are flat out on this thing. I got a solid 1.2 gigabytes per second all day. But performance isn't the only thing this box has going for it. The out-of-the-box experience buying a pre-built NAS is night and day. Sure, you can't tweak every little knob in detail, but the software is easy and intuitive. On first boot, it upgraded itself to the latest firmware. The setup wizard holds your hand just enough to get a storage volume going in less than five minutes. And after some RAID 5 testing, switching to a 10 drive and two spare RAID 10 array only took a minute or so. But both RAID setups still saw write speeds averaging around 600 megabytes per second and read speeds still saturated the 10 gig connection at 1.2 gigabytes per second regardless of the RAID type. I even tried a 3-drive RAID 0, and that too wrote to the drives at 600 megabytes per second. So the limitation is in the CPU here, and there are two reasons for that. First, the CPU is slightly underpowered for a bunch of fast NVMe drives, but more importantly, it doesn't have enough native PCIe lanes. It only has eight lanes, and if you're stuffing drives in all 12 slots, you'd need 48 lanes to give them all the bandwidth they use. Add on the 10 gig NIC, and you need more than 50 PCIe lanes to avoid any bottlenecks. But then, how does this work? 50 lanes of hardware on eight lanes of PCI Express? Well, Asus Store is pulling a little magic using these tiny AS media chips. They're like Ethernet switches, but for PCI Express devices. They split up one lane into many, so these chips split up eight lanes into all the lanes required for all these drives. But switches aren't magic. The overhead takes out some performance, and the result is a NAS that can only really write around 600 megabytes per second, no matter what type of RAID you use. And that's not bad, it's just <laughs> I see the potential and I want more, maybe in the next gen flash store. Read speeds were great though, and that's more important for what I do, video editing over the network. I'm gonna replace my old edit NAS with this thing. The NVMe drives in here should be a little faster than the SATA drives I used in that one, plus this NAS only uses about 50 watts of power under load, so it'll save a tiny bit on power consumption over the Xeon system I was using. To test video editing performance, I copied all 13 hours of footage from my Mr. Beast project into a Final Cut Pro timeline. Besides crashing once when I tried copying like 100 gigabytes at once, the NAS handled editing over the network like a champ. The crash was more Final Cut Pro's fault than the NAS. Just as an aside, to get the best experience on my Mac, I turned on SMB multi-channel and the macOS VFS compatibility checkbox in the Asus Store SMB settings. But nothing stuttered at all while I was scrubbing around, and I'm playing the full res 4K clips here. I was a little concerned about heat since there aren't any SSD heat sinks. The design relies just on this one fan on the bottom, but the CPU stayed under 85 degrees Celsius most of the time, and the drives never got over 50 degrees in my testing. The box puts out a little heat on the left side, so on a cold day, I guess I could just use it as a hand warmer. And the fan is audible, but it isn't annoying like the tiny fan on the pocket NAS. And if you put it under your desk or in a rack, you're not gonna hear it at all. So what's the verdict? Does this thing win? Well, we'll get to that. First, I wanted to highlight my favorite new feature on the Flash Store, and that's TrueNAS. Wait, what? I've always wanted ZFS on my Asus Store NASs, but my older boxes only run ADM. And right now, at least, ADM doesn't support ZFS, only basic RAID and BTRFS. Those aren't bad, but ZFS has features I like for data integrity and sync. 
So when I found out Asus Store's not locking down this thing at all, I had to see how TrueNAS runs. This box is a pretty standard Intel PC under the hood, so you can press F2 during boot and get into the BIOS. So I did that and installed TrueNAS on an external SSD. I have a detailed write-up on my blog, so I won't go through how I did it here. Check out the link below. But bottom line, it was easy to get TrueNAS up and running. Just like with RAID, ZFS write speeds always topped out around 600 megabytes per second, but it was a little strange. I could only get around 700 megabytes per second read speeds using RAID Z2. And even if I used a ZFS stripe, I could only get about a gigabyte per second, which was slower than the 1.2 gigabytes per second I got with ADM. The CPU did seem to run a little hotter under TrueNAS though, so I'm wondering if maybe thermal performance or fan control tuning could have made a difference. I checked on the CPU frequencies and it looked pretty normal, bursting between 2.6 and 2.9 gigahertz, but it's something I'll be testing more. For now, I've switched back to ADM, but I'm floored that Asus Store is making their hardware more appealing by not locking it to their own proprietary OS. In 10 years, if Flash Store support ends, I could still install another OS on it and get more useful life out of it. That means this hardware is infinitely more flexible than a locked down box. Of course, the ARM board that the Pocket NAS uses was never locked down at all, except for the fact that a lot of ARM chip vendors like Rockchip never really provide long-term Linux support for their silicon. So this Rock 5 is faster than a Raspberry Pi, but it's also nowhere near the speed I got with the Flash Store, even considering it's half the price. I'm excited though, because this Pocket NAS that Rick made was just his first try. Makers like Rick keep iterating, and there are a ton of cool DIY NAS solutions that are out on the horizon. Even so, not everyone needs a 10 gig video editing NAS like I do. The Pocket NAS would be awesome for travel. It runs on 10 watts, so it's gonna get a lot further for you off grid. But in the end, I do have to crown a victor. This round, once again, goes to the Asus Store. It's the one that I'm gonna be installing in my rack. But Asus Store better stay on their toes. What if I turn my Monster ARM server into a NAS? Its 128 lanes of PCI Express bandwidth would eat the Flash Store for lunch. I mean, it's more than double the price of the Flash Store, but if I cared about fairness, I wouldn't be running a Raspberry Pi against a consumer NAS now, would I? So we have a victor for round three, but who are these NASs for? All Flash NAS devices serve a pretty small niche right now. SSDs are still too expensive to beat hard drives on a price per terabyte basis, and hard drives aren't that bad, even for video editing, if you throw a bunch of them together in RAID. But Flash is the future. I think both of these guys offer a glimpse at the type of size, performance, and silence we'll expect out of our storage in the next five or 10 years. For all but the most devoted data hoarders, these things will be the norm, not the exception. They just need a little better CPU and a little more time for SSD costs to come down. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.